I think you heard more about Christianity this morning than you did about Judaism. I apologize for that. But uh, it's always good to know each other's cultures. Um, and if you want to hear more, I'm continuing my series with uh, Reverend Gareth Evans of the Episcopal Church in uh, uh, Irvington uh, at the JCC. We did one session about Abraham. Um, and we're going to do a second one about the Binding of Isaac story at the JCC on February 7th. So maybe that's where we should reserve most of those comments for. There is a scene in a movie called Moonstruck, which I love. I love the movie. I love Nicolas Cage. I love Cher. And there's a scene in which, you, if you've seen the movie, you know Nicolas Cage is in love with Cher. Uh, huge age difference between the two of them. Cher is not interested in the Nicolas Cage character, and he is just fawning on her. And at some point... She turns and she slaps him in the face and says, snap out of it. Do you, anybody remember that scene? Okay, good. And essentially what that moment is about is telling uh, Nicolas Cage's character to get hold of himself, right? Like snap out of it is, is a way of saying, get control of yourself because sometimes we lose control of ourselves. In an attempt to try and control everything around us, we sometimes lose control of ourselves. And that is why in Perkei Avot, it teaches that very famous statement, Ezehu Gibor Hakoveshet Yitzro, a person who is truly strong, um, a person who can control his own impulses, his own inclinations. And it would be great if that were that easy, right? To say to ourselves, wouldn't it be great if I could just get control of myself? So many of us go down that rabbit hole of thought in which we spiral out of control as we try to imagine every possible scenario and how we might confront the challenges that they bring. So it would be great if we could um, control ourselves in the way that Perkei Avot suggests to us that that is the mark of a truly powerful person, an individual who has control of themselves. Lord Acton uh, once claimed that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And that too is another way of suggesting that there is a challenge that goes with power and control and the desire for more and more of it. So this morning I want to suggest an entirely different paradigm for living. And that is to suggest that what would happen to our lives if we gave up some of that power, if we gave up some of that control, in fact, chose to look at the world differently and not as a battle of wills, but about allowing things to occur. This morning's Torah reading is really all about that. And it's not just this morning's Torah reading. It's almost every story that's led us to this moment in the Torah up until this, mo until this morning's reading. So a quick overview. God wants to, in the story of creation, assert control over humans' behavior by saying, you can eat anything you want, just not from this one tree. Humanity then tries to assert its control and say, I'll eat whatever I want. The snake tries to control the human beings by convincing them to eat of the tree. Then God asserts control over the snake who loses all power and control over even his own limbs to lie and crawl on the ground. And we see story after story unfold in the Torah uh, through this morning's reading about power and control. Abraham tells Sarah, make believe you're my sister so they who have control won't take control over me. Abraham asserts control over Sarah. Sarah later, when she becomes pregnant and has a child, asserts control over Hagar who has no agency in her own life. And so on and so on it goes until we get to the story of Joseph and his brothers. 
one trying to assert control over the others, saying, I am more powerful, you will bow down to me. It's all about power and control. And ultimately, he gets to Egypt and he rises to the second most powerful position in Egypt. Joseph's relentless pursuit of power leads him right to the top, second in charge. And that ultimately brings, as we will see later, because we already know the entire story, that will lead to the enslavement of the Jewish people, the relationship between master and slave is an important understanding about who has control and who has power. Interestingly enough, I took a quiz in the New York Times the other day about how woke I am. <laughs> Turns out I'm not very woke because I got the very first question wrong. It asked me, should I refer to the master bedroom or the, pri uh, the primary bedroom? So the answer is the primary bedroom, not the master bedroom, because the very word master speaks of power and control over somebody else. And that I, as the master of the house, allow others to live in other bedrooms in the house. I'm not so woke. But it does raise for me an understanding about the dynamics of power and control. And ultimately, I love the comment that absolute power demoralizes because it demoralizes both the victim and it lessens the victimizer. So let's zoom in for just a moment in one sentence of this morning's Torah reading in which Joseph has an encounter with his brothers after an incredibly complicated, almost absurd game that Joseph plays with his brothers because they don't recognize him. And it's clear to me, maybe it's not, but it's so obvious to me that the reason why Joseph plays this game is because he's out of control. It's not because he wants to manipulate his brothers and he wants to really push the point home that he's really in charge and they're not. He seems to me to be out of control, adding one thing to the next to the story until Ultimately, there is the revelation that Joseph is who he is. The, emo the emotions boil over and Joseph can't hide his pain and his identity any further. It says, Vayomer Yosef elachav, ani Yosef. Joseph said to his brothers, I I'm Joseph. I'm not Potipharach as they refer to me. I am actually Joseph, your brother. And then the second half of the verse, which comes almost within the same breath, Haod Avichai, is my father alive? Now, it's a bizarre question, right? Because Judah has already told him that his father is alive. He's already told him that he can't go get his younger brother because it would kill his father. But the truth is, sometimes when we are so busy trying to control every aspect of our lives, we sometimes don't even hear the most obvious things. His brothers then are completely dumbfounded. As the conclusion of the verse says, that they couldn't even respond because they were so dumbfounded by this revelation that this was Joseph. They couldn't even hear his question. We know that's what happens when we lose control of everything in our lives. We lose control of our senses as well. And here we see they've lost their ability to hear. They've already tried to explain that their father is alive, but they are unable to because of Joseph's blind ambition. And that is for control and to assert power over his brothers. The brothers have been set on edge. Their strength and their power is taken from them. And they too become deaf to what's going on. Joseph is blinded by his own power 
and his ability to manipulate in that he loses his ability to remember what's already been told to him. You see, absolute power demoralizes. Joseph loses some of his own senses when he seeks out power. And it's the Kliyakar that offers us a series of amazing comments on this verse. He makes incredibly important points about the power grab in that moment. Joseph has the power of Egypt and he has the power of wealth and he has the power of station. But Judah and his brothers ultimately have the power of family and control over their own siblings. So the Kliakar says, that maybe they were just lying. That's what the Kliakar says is what Joseph thought. He thought maybe his brothers were just lying about their father being alive so as to incur, to elicit greater empathy. So strange. Why would Joseph assume his brothers were lying? Maybe it's because they are liars. Maybe it's because they have told many an untruth. First, we killed our brother. Or first, he was killed. Right? That's the lie. Then he was sold. Joseph believes his brothers to be extraordinary liars, except for one detail. He has no idea what they told his father. To which I say, it's a simple point. Trusting people, trust others. Trustworthy people, trust others. Liars think everyone is lying. Joseph, maybe he didn't have full control of himself. And maybe he didn't trust himself. And that's why he projects that onto his brothers. But the Kliakar goes on even further. The Kliakar says something really beautiful here. He says, Al hazaken velo yigromlo mita ki nafshok shura benafsho. Al kain she'alam shenit ha'od avichai. Kliakar says, why does he have to ask if his father's alive? They ask the question, Joseph asked the question a second time because it's possible that in fact they were talking about their father, not his father. He imagines a wild conversation that's going on between Judah and Joseph. He says, we can almost hear Judah say, your father? You call him your father when all these years you had the opportunity to make contact with him and you didn't? You call him your father? You weren't around when we had to pick up the pieces after you were gone. You weren't the one who took care of your father in all those years of suffering in his grieving state. And you call him your father? He wasn't your father. He's our father. You can hear that because so many siblings have that argument towards the end of their parents' life where they say to each other, you think you helped out? Where were you when dad went to the hospital? Where were you when mom fell down? And you can hear the Kliakar has offered us such a beautiful translation here or a, a beautiful imagination of the moment in which Judah says, I'm taking some of my control back. Essentially, Judah is saying to Joseph, you've lost the right to call him your father. At that moment, the Kliakar imagines Judah says, I'm done with this game. I know who you really are. And you have no power over me at all. You know the moment in our lives when conversations change, when people seize control, when the tables turn, when the best defense 
is a good offense. And then there's silence. That's what the text says. And then there's silence. The brothers can't respond. Brothers couldn't answer. And we're apt to ask the question, why now? For me, the answer lies in the understanding of power and control. And that is that power and control achieve nothing. There's absolute silence because it's a stalemate. At some point, two equal forces are going to butt up against each other and they will go nowhere. That's the lesson of power and control. It ultimately leads to nothing but destruction. We see it in a power of wills in the Ukraine and Russia. It's leading to just destruction because one wants to assert power and control over another. For me, the answer lies in the fact that we're left with nothing when our lives are about power and control. They get in the way of meaningful and purposeful and intentional connections. That's what kept Joseph and his brothers apart. Jimi Hendrix said it best, right? When the power of love overcomes the love of power, then the world will know peace. When Christopher Columbus came to the United States, he came in contact with Native Americans. It was actually the Arawak people of the Bahamas. And this is what he wrote in his journal on that meeting. They willingly traded us everything they owned. They do not bear arms and do not know them, for I showed them a sword and they took it by its edge and cut themselves out of ignorance. They will make fine slaves. With 50 men, we could subjugate them all and make them do whatever we want. That's real American history for you. Our history, both as Jews and as Americans, is a history of kings and priests with absolute power, ruling masses who have none. That was the mentality of the men who discovered America. And that's the mentality that our society struggles with today. What we know of history is how one dominant culture justifies its actions. The view of history from a thousand feet shows us the horrific pain and suffering we hurl on each other just trying to take what they worked so hard to build, trying to take what they worked so hard to create. So the prayer that we offer always is the same. Lo yisagoyel goy cherev lo yilmadu od milchama. We pray that nation will not lift up sword against nation, and the world won't know war anymore. The famous phrase, the most critical phrase in all of Torah, the Haftal Recha Kamocha, love your neighbor as yourself, is essentially that same tune that we always sing. Don't walk in front of me, I may not follow. Don't walk behind me, I may not lead. Just walk beside me and be my friend. Together we can walk in the path of Hashem. That's what it's supposed to be about. It's not supposed to be who's in charge and who's following. It's not supposed to be who's walking in front and who's walking behind. But how do we figure out to be in real, purposeful, intentional relationship with each other without trying to be in charge? When one person, when one country, when one culture learns that we don't need to build our houses on top of other people's houses, then we can learn to live side by side. Shabbat shalom. We continue with the Chatzik Kaddish, page 184. Please rise. 